Welcome everyone to our fall literary lecture series hosted by the Antrim Literature Project, an online public humanities platform that aims to make the study of literature accessible to readers beyond the paywalls of the university. We're happy to offer this series of free introductory lectures on a variety of topics. This is our last lecture of the series, so we're excited. You can find all of the other lectures on our database at antrimliteratureproject.org. Kara McCabe is giving our final lecture tonight. She is a PhD candidate at Tufts University. In her dissertation titled Stage Magic, Dramatizations of Early Modern Witchcraft, Kara examines the relationship between the portrayal of witches on stage and the complicated nature of truth-telling in pamphlets, court records, and treatises of the period. She hopes to show that the demonization of women's knowledge is at the heart of the witchcraft myth. Her other research interests include cultural criticism, history of the book, and maternity. And her lecture tonight is titled, Charming Witches in Early Modern Drama. Thank you, Kara. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that introduction, Adam, and to everybody for joining us tonight. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I have some slides prepared for you all. Um, of course, as we're working with drama, a lot of it, forgive me, will be pretty text heavy, um, but I found some really fun pictures to share as well. So um, let's jump in with both feet here. So we're talking about charming witches in early modern drama. And I just wanna be upfront here. I'm using the word charming in a very different way. These are not nice witches. These are not kind witches. They are witches that do spells, that do charms, that are challenging paradigms, both of gender and behavior during the early modern period, and probably, you know, gendered paradigms of our, our modern period as well. So first question, who were the witches in early modern England? This is an easy and a difficult question to answer. Because with any historical figure, with any myth, with any legend, as witches, you know, are, we have to acknowledge what assumptions we bring to the table along with the true fact of who were the women who were tried for witchcraft. So the true fact of it is, is that the women who were tried for witchcraft were often older. They were often indigent women, so they were not women of means. And they were women who, for some reason or for multiple reasons, were at the edges of their community. And by the edge of their community, I take that both literally and figuratively. So literally, these were the women that did not live in the heart of a town. These were the women who lived out in the fields, out in huts, in smaller homes, in rundown homes that weren't central physically to the life of the community. They were also not central figuratively. They were not integrated into society. They were not perhaps regular attendees at church. They were not women who necessarily had children. Again, they were not women of means. They were sometimes married women and they were sometimes not. But these were women who didn't fit into the fabric. And it was very easy in a certain sense to charge these women with witchcraft. They were unfortunately disposable. And so we have to carry that factual knowledge, that understanding alongside the legends that are baked into who or what we think witches are. And I know that we are, you know, some time away from Halloween, away from seeing witches in people's front yards, but the American witch, that Halloween witch, and even the historical witch, we think about the witch midwife. Were midwives actually charged with witchcraft? No, only one is recorded having been charged with a crime of witchcraft. We think of young women being charged for witchcraft, for running through the woods and howling at the moon. Did that happen? No, but it, it's in movies, it's in legends, it tells a really great story, but it isn't necessarily the truth of what happened. So one of the things that we're going to think about tonight before we dig into the plays themselves is who were the women that were tried and how do the plays pick up on the texts of the period to start to tell a story about witchcraft, which is true 
and untrue. So we're going to deal a little bit with questions of belief, questions of faith, and questions of knowledge while we do that. So I have a very short timeline for you here. A lot of the source material for the witchcraft and myth and for the trials that came about in the early modern period is the Malleus Maleficarum. And that's published, written and published in 1486. The Malleus Maleficarum is a lot to do with lustful witches, witches that were frightening to men because they challenged them sexually. Some scholars do argue that Kramer wrote his sections of the Malleus because he needed to blame women for his own lustful feelings. And this comes out of a series of witchcraft trials in Germany that Kramer attended and he looks at the he looks at those witch trials. He looks at those women on trial and he says, what's happening is your fault. You are lustful. You are dangerous to men. You are dangerous to society. And so here is the problem, right? The Malleus Maleficarum translated into English is the hammer of witches. The Malleus becomes, as we move forward through time, the blueprint for witchcraft trials, witchcraft tests some of which you may have heard of, like dunking or poking, um, and also later texts. One of those later texts is 1580 of the Demon Mania of Sorcerers, and that's from a French author, Baudin. And Baudin, again, really took off what Kramer had already said, challenges witches with this lustful, dangerous action in society and pushes the conversation forward. Now, you'll notice in 1584, I've highlighted that text in red. I'm going to skip Scott for just a second and jump to 1597 to James I's demonology. When James I publishes demonology, he's king of Scotland. He is really very worried about witches and witchcraft challenging his right as sovereign. At this point in his reign, Anything that gets in the way of his God-given right to rule is something that he is going to push against and something that he sees as really, really threatening. One of the things that's really important to understand and point out is that these three texts, the Malleus, Demon Mania, Demonology, these are all texts that believe strongly in witchcraft. These are not skeptical texts. These are not texts that question witchcraft. When James I writes demonology, he really truly believes that the witches are coming for him and that they are going to threaten his monarchy, they are going to bring up a tempest, and they will be the end of him. Now, Reginald Scott in 1584 publishes The Discovery of Witchcraft, in which he says the witchcraft thing, not true. He's completely disbelieving. He's completely skeptical. Because he reasons that the witch can't do any of the things that she's being charged with doing. She can't bring up a tempest. She can't sicken your cows. She can't make it through so your butter won't churn. Because the only person or being that has the power to work those miracles is God. Scott says the witch can't do any of those things because you're giving her the power that God has. And so the argument falls apart. What Scott does throughout the course of that text is he takes apart how the witch argument works and also in later editions of the text begins to take apart how what we would see as like magicians or magic do their sleight of hand. And whether he intended it or not, Scott actually ends up writing an instruction manual. This is how you do this. This is how this works. Here are the recipes, right? Here are the charms. And he does that through collecting all of the different witchcraft texts of the period, combining them and presenting those arguments and dismantling them one by one. And we'll engage with him a little bit deeper as we talk about Thomas Milton and the witch. So the two plays that we're gonna speak in depth about today um, are Macbeth and The Witch. So Macbeth was composed circa 1606. Of course, it's not super clear um, when either of these plays were written, but it was first published in the first folio of 1623. The Witch 
is believed to have been written around 1613 and wasn't first published until 1778. So it existed in manuscript form for quite a while before it was published formally. One of the reasons for this was that the witch wasn't actually performed many times. There were real questions about whether or not it was appropriate for the stage. And you'll see maybe a little bit about why those questions were raised tonight. One of the things that I also wanna note as we move forward is there is crosstalk between Macbeth and the witch. There are many scholars that believe that Hecate's speeches in Macbeth were actually written by Middleton and push, pushed into Shakespeare's play in later forms. So it's very possible that that 1606 first go, right, first edition, maybe we'll call it, of Macbeth was edited significantly by Middleton for later performances. Of course, Shakespeare's name is the one that's still on it. So we'll talk about it as Shakespeare's play. But there are reasons to believe that Hecate's speech is Middleton's. Partly, of course, is the way that Hecate features in The Witch. So we're going to look at The Witch first, only because it's the play that I think is less familiar. Macbeth is taught over and over and over in high schools and colleges. It has become a part of our English lexicon. We think of double, double, toil and trouble, cauldron burn and fire bubble, right? That is very, very common. That comes from Shakespeare, right? That comes from Macbeth. But the witch is a little bit witchier, right? And forgive, forgive the pun, but it's a little bit witchier. It is a little bit more extreme in the way that it answers some of these questions about witchcraft during the period. So a broad overview of The Witch. The Witch is a play that, like many plays of the period, has multiple storylines going on at once. There is a love story, there is Hecate's witch story, there is a political story. I'm gonna focus only on Hecate's witch story. I'm gonna focus only on the charms that she's doing here, just because there is not enough time in our, our day together um, to be able to really talk about all of those different stories and how they interact. One of the things that I think is important to note, though, is that Hecate's role in The Witch is both as problem solver and as the cause of problems. So like many other witches during the period, one of which would be Mother Bombi, who features, her, features in her own play, People come to these witches, they come to these women looking for answers and looking for solutions. So unlike someone like Mother Bombi, who's in John Liley's play, unlike Mother Bombi, Hecate throws in her own desire into every question or request that she gets. So every time somebody comes to her in the play and says, I need a love charm, I need you to solve this problem, I need you to kill this person, she says, okay, I'll do your thing, but I'm also gonna do my thing too, right? I've got desires, I've got needs, I've got revenge I want to enact. And she adds that on as she goes through in a way that really reclaims her power throughout. So she doesn't act for others. She acts for herself first, and she also does what they want her to do mostly because they they pay her. There is an economic exchange built in there. So this is one of Hecate's first appearances in the play. This is act one, scene two. And this is one of the first spells that she's doing. Hecate and the weird sisters in Macbeth share something that's really important, and that is a coven. Unlike other witchcraft plays of the period, Mother Bombi, the Witch of Edmonton, these women are acting in groups. Other witches of the period are often featured solo. That's true for plays. That's also true for the pamphlets and records that claimed to be true reports of these witchcraft trials. So this spell is Hecate speaking it, but the other witches around her are participating as well. The witches around her appear in their human form, but they also sometimes appear as animals. So in the text, if ever you have the chance to read the play, which I highly recommend, you may notice that sometimes it's a person and sometimes it's an animal, which is, is pretty fun. 
So she says, there, take this unbaptized brat, boil it well, preserve the fat, our anointed flesh into the air, in moonlight nights or steepled tops, mountains and pine trees that like the pricks or stops seem to our height, high towers and roofs of princes like wrinkles in the earth, whole provinces appear to our scythe and even leak a russet mole upon some lady's cheek. When hundred leagues in the air we feast and sing, dance, kiss and call, use everything. What young man can we wish to pleasure us, but we enjoy him in an incubus. So these speeches, as with many speeches in the early modern period, we can take them at their face value, and we can also, of course, read between the lines. Now, at its face value, this is a spell. This is ingredients being added to a cauldron, but it is also the result of those ingredients. So you are reading it correctly if you're seeing it and you're saying, there, take this unbaptized brat, boil it well. She very literally means take this child, take this unbaptized child and boil it. Preserve the fat. So they are in a cauldron rendering the fat of an infant, of a child. It is really important in this context that the child is unbaptized. And the act of baptism and the anointing with holy oil would have protected the child and made the magic not work. So take this unbaptized brat, boil it well and preserve the fat. Our anointed flesh. So the witches are going to use this boiled child, the fat of the child, along with several other herbs, which we'll talk about shortly, to anoint their flesh to give them the power to fly. Again, this is a moment where the history of witchcraft, where the texts that we're drawing from, and this comes directly from Reginald Scott's discovery of witches, witchcraft, is counter to some of the legends that we think we know. So these witches do not need brooms to fly. They are not stealing vacuums like in Hocus Pocus to fly. They are anointing their flesh. They're doing magic to be able to fly through the air. The action of flying is, as we can imagine, incredibly freeing, incredibly powerful. And it's important to note in this speech, in this spell, how and where the witch makes herself both physically higher, right, than the world around her, and also claims power that may or may not be hers. So on moonlight nights or steepletops, mountains and pine trees that like pricks or stops seem to our height. So they are higher than the mountains. They are higher than the pine trees. They are higher than the church. They are above physically the church building, but they are also above metaphorically the reach of the church or the power of the church. So they have made themselves, these women, more powerful than men's organization, right? Men's churches, than princes, than provinces. So that all of these buildings become like the wrinkles in the earth. So small that they're like a mole on a woman's cheek, like a russet mole upon some lady's cheek. When hundred leagues in the air, we feast and sing. So this is an act of joy. Even at the same time that these women are claiming power through an incredibly disturbing action, right? Boiling an infant. It is joyful. We dance and sing, we kiss and call, we use everything. We are free. This is an act of freedom. It's an act of agency. It's an act of power, but there's also joy there. Now in this scene and in the subsequent speeches, there are two he's and him's. The first he is the unbaptized brat. The second is the him at the end of the speech, but we enjoy him in an incubus. And that is the next him that I want to look at. Last night, last night thou gotst the mayor of Welpy's son. I knew him by his black cloak lined with yellow. I think thou spoiled the youth, he's but 17. 
I'll have him the next mounting, away, in, go feed the vessel for the second hour. So at the same time that they are making this salve, making this ointment, they're also talking about what they will do when they fly and what they have done when they fly. So many of the witches of the early modern period demonstrate appetites and desires that are really centered on power. They're very centered on power. So these witches are flying through the moonlight and elsewhere in the play, Hecate asks, Hecate asks, what young man can we wish to pleasure us, but we enjoy him in an incubus, right? We already saw that in the previous speech. Hecate seeks a young man to pleasure us. And while pleasure can be disinterested, it can be, be impartial, it's not without the clear reference to sexual pleasure, as Hecate is looking for a young man to pleasure her. So Again, these plays, they're body, they're brazen. These witches are powerful and claiming something that shouldn't necessarily be theirs. An incubus in this case, and this that is the word that she used, and I'll go back to the previous slide so you can see it. The incubus is actually a male demon who has sexual intercourse with sleeping women. And so even the word that she uses here is opposite to what it should be. It should actually be succubus. So she uses the masculine form instead of the feminine form, and this is no mistake, as a further claim toward power. Because she's not doing or not fulfilling what we would see as the woman or the feminine role, even in, you know, being a demon, <laughs> essentially, right? So needing to enjoy him in an incubus would actually require Hecate to either have a long-standing relationship with a demon or to have access to the power and ability to make that demon do her will. And so by exposing that relationship, we actually are able to see the power that she claims through action and through partnership with what we can call demons or the devil. So yes, she is making the ointment. Yes, she is doing the spell, but she is also partnering with beings that maybe are more powerful than she is or who lend her their power to be able to do essentially what she wants, right? Because she has no reason to be doing this in the play. She's answering to her own desire. And again, she's doing it in a way that is kind of fun. She's not apologizing. She's just doing it. In the context of this part of the speech, last night thou got the mayor of wealthy son. She's speaking to other one of the other witches named Stadlin. And Stadlin got the boy last night. The use of got in this context can mean got as in to choose, um, as in to choose maybe one among many. He is who she chose last night. But it can also mean the traditional sense of be got. Um, in the second case, the verse plays with the gender of the word because we think about begats in the Bible as being of patriarchal lineage. But in this case, we have women who are witches saying, oh, you got him, you begot him, you laid claim to him. But also it engages in a lower level with this idea of matriarchal lineage. Because in the play, Hecate has a son. His name is Firestone. And he is really, really angry at her most of the time because he has no power. And she does. And he has no father. So she enacts this in her speech, but she also behaves this way within the course of the play. Stablin having got the boy again, uses a feminine word against a male body, usurping this patriarchal process or this patriarchal right. Dadlin has also spoiled him. I think thou spoiled the youth, he's but 17. Perhaps because he's no longer a virgin or no longer innocent. Throughout the play though, when Hecate and her coven are on stage, the terms that are used to describe women and their bodies are actually applied to male bodies. So we would think about the politics during the time period, the social structures during the time period, as thinking of women's virginity, 
and women's innocence, women's chastity as being paramount. Women were spoiled, women were fallen. But in this case, it's the male youth that's been spoiled. It's the male youth that's no longer innocent. And he doesn't have a name. He's only identified as the mayor of Wealthy's son. So he isn't even granted a name. He isn't even granted personhood in that context. I want to move on to the first he, the first him, who is, again, the baby, who is being made into this ointment. So these speeches happen in this order. So there's the first introduction of boil this baby. We're going to fly. Last night you got the mayor of wealthy son. And now we have to proceed with the actual work of this spell. Now, the they at the beginning of this speech is referencing other ingredients or herbs that are being used in the preparation of this ointment. And I want to look very closely at some of the herbs that are being used here, because there's a little bit of science that works in a fun way, and there's a lot of science that doesn't. So she says, they're down his throat, his mouth crammed full, his ears and nostrils stuffed. I thrust in eleusinium lately, in contium, frons populus, and soot. You may see that he looks so black by the mouth. Then Siam, Acarum vulgaro, to Pentaphyllin, the blood of a flitter mouse, Solanum, significum et oleum. Some of these herbs are things that are easily, you know, used, translated into modern English. Some of them aren't. So one thing that I do want to point out before we launch into some of the details here, Pentaphyllin only means a five-leafed plant. It's unclear what five-leafed plant that is. Um, there's no indication and it's really difficult to find herbals of the period to help to, you know, clarify what that would be. But most of the other herbs are easily clarified. So when we look at perhaps Eleusinium first, that would be, and I just want to make sure that I have it correct in my notes, Wild parsley. So wild parsley is also known as devil's oatmeal, persil, and it ex and we can understand parsley's power in a magical sense as being primarily for increased lust, purification, and protection. One of the really, really fun things about this work, and one of the things I love about my research, is that on any given day, I have the discovery of witchcraft on my desk, desk, I have the Bible, I have modern witchcraft herbals and old witchcraft texts. And so we see a little bit of inherited belief here. And this, this belief that it's for increased lust actually comes from a modern text. Is parsley psychogenic? No. So the belief that it's having some kind of actor action isn't actually going to pan out in this context. Now, the next herb that she mentions, Ancontinum, is monkshod or wolfsbane. This one is incredibly, incredibly poisonous. Um, it is really, really dangerous, um, but modern magic books, modern herbals will say that it should be used and can be used wrapped in cloth. Specifically, I found a spell that said that it should be wrapped in the lizard's skin and carried against the body to allow you to become invisible at will. So invisibility, very handy, but again, not psychotropic, just poisonous. And so one of the things that's interesting to think about is herbs used in texts of this period, thrown around, right, almost literally, in this case, being stuffed into a baby, um, are kind of at odds, often at odds, uh, with medical, modern medical knowledge, right? Modern medicine does not say that monk shed will make you invisible, but it does say that it is a toxin that produces seizures. 
causing vomiting, weakness, and paralysis. The next herb on the list is Franz Poplius, which is just poplar leaves. Um, in a magical context, meant to facilitate astral projection and sometimes placed upon the body or made into an ointment. So there is a modern and an early modern conversation for that specific plant in using it as an ointment for astral projection. And astral projection, of course, is the ability for you to send your spirit or send your body out somewhere else, out to someone else or somewhere else. Science though, that doesn't pan out. Poplar leaves, not toxic necessarily, but also not hallucinogenic, not necessarily helpful. Soot is the same. Soot is actually exactly what you think it is. Soot from the bottom of fire, the bottom of a fireplace, the only real reason that soot would be in a, an ointment like this one is because it makes it black, which is pretty cool. And it can serve as a binder. So soot, of course, is organic matter. It's high in carbon. It can be a really helpful binder between the oil and the herbs, but it has no property that would make it do anything um, other than, you know, adding a little bit of color and, add, and acting as a binder. Then. As we continue, Siam are water parsnips. Um, and it's unclear what kind of water parsnip is being referenced here. Some water parsnips can be poisonous, especially if they're the kind of water parsnip that looks like poisonous hemlock. And they grow often together at the edges of rivers and lakes. So it's possible always with early modern texts like this one, that they've used one word and meant something else. So yes, it is possible that they meant hemlock, but that is not what they said. So we actually kind of have to take that one at face value. Uh, water parsnips can actually be cooked and eaten. Apparently they taste very nutty, um, but we don't suggest, or, or texts don't suggest looking for them because again, you might get the wrong kind of parsnip. The next is Akron bulgaro, and that is common myrtle, the myrtle leaves. And in witchcraft texts, it's known to be a love herb. And it is to be added to all love sachets and spells, especially those designed to keep love alive and exciting. It also is very non-toxic. It is not doing anything. Um, it has small, small white flowers that are actually really beautiful. I'm going to skip over pentathylin. We already covered that one. The blood of a flitter mouse is bat's blood. So a flitter mouse in early modern speak is a bat. And a bat's blood, just like soot, beyond being interesting, adding color, being sensational, isn't adding anything. One of the questions that I asked myself the first time that I ran through this text quite a while ago now is, well, well could, the, could the flitter mouse, could the bat have had rabies? <laughs> like, what if that is the thing that is adding something to this spell? Unfortunately, the CDC says the blood of an animal that has rabies does not increase the likelihood that you get rabies. So it's just bat's blood. The last is the real kicker, the last herb on the list. It is the most psychoactive among them and maybe the only one that is doing anything here. This is deadly nightshade oil, Solanum significum et oleum, deadly nightshade oil. Some nightshades, as you may know, are harmless. Tomatoes and eggplants are both nightshades. Some nightshades are harmful. So these toxic nightshades cause dry, warm, and flushed skin, which will be very important in a moment, garbled speech, delirium, and hallucinations. These hallucinations may be quite troubling and patients may develop severe dysphoria and agitated delirium. So that is the herb, if ever there were one in this spell, which might actually produce some kind of effect. It can also produce slight fevers, but usually not above 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Note though, that none of these herbs would result in flight. So this recipe from Middleton is pulled directly out of 
Reginald Scott. He, it's almost like, and probably did, Middleton went to, to Scott, picked out the recipe, combined a couple of things together, and then put it in his play. And, you know, more power to him. So in Scott, he says three different things. This is the first. And he's reporting what he's discovered in other texts. So don't take this as a statement of belief. He says that you should take the fat of young children and seethe it with water in a brazen vessel, reserving the thickest of that which remaineth boiled on the bottom, which they lay up and keep, the they are the witches in this context, until occasion serveth to use it. They put hereunto Eliocenium and Acontium, Franz Populus, and Soot. So that is one recipe, or we could say the first of several recipes. The second calls for Siam, a carom vulgare, pentaphyllin, and the blood of a fl flitter mouse, selenum, uh, somniferum, and oleum. And they stamp these together, and then they rub all parts of their body exceedingly. So they look red and be very hot. And that's where the reference to red flushed skin and fevers comes forward. So even in a text from the 16th century, even in Reginald Scott, who's very, very skeptical, there's actually scientific truth to that, right? They will become red. They will be very hot. The pores may be opened so their flesh is soluble and loose. By this means, saith he, and a moonlight night, they seem to be carried by the air to feasting, singing, dancing, kissing, culling, and other acts of venery with such youths as they love or desire most. And again, Scott mirroring Middleton, Middleton mirroring Scott here. The next part that I want to point out is this argument that Scott makes, along with the other folks that he's talking to and with, about the power of the imagination. He talks about it as the power of the imagination, of course, understanding a little bit of the science and the background. We also can understand it as the power of these plants, as the power of hallucination. For the force, saith he, of their imagination is so vehement that almost all the part of the brain wherein the memory consisteth is full of such conceits. And whereas they are naturally prone to believe anything so do they receive such impressions and steadfast imaginations to their mind, as even their spirits are altered thereby. And this helpeth them forward in their imaginations. This blames the witch for her own belief. So it, it says, this is not true, this is not happening, but they believe it happens. They believe it is happening. And there's a story that Scott builds in here, which I'm not going to read the entire thing of just because I want to be mindful of our time together. But there's a story that Scott builds in of a man who is observing a witch. And she says, I'm going to go and I'm going to run this errand for you. And I'm going to come back and you'll see that I can fly. You'll see that this is true. But in order for me to do this, you all have to leave the room. So the men leave the room. And they stare at her, they peek in on her through a chink in the door. And it says, and when she had undressed herself and frothed her body with certain ointments, she fell down to the force of those superfluous and sleepy ointments into a most sound and heavy sleep. So she passes out, to use the colloquial term, after having spread this ointment all over her body, such that these men can break in and then they beat her exceedingly. There is in witchcraft lore, in witchcraft plays, in witchcraft pamphlets and texts, a lot of beating of women. They did beat her exceedingly. But the force of her sleep was such as it took away from her the sense of feeling. So she is completely absent. Now when her strength and powers were wearied and decayed, she awoke of her own accord and began to speak many vain and doting words, affirming that she had passed over both sense seas and mountains, delivering to us many untrue and re fast reports. We earnestly denied them. She impudently affirmed them. So this narrative harkens back to this idea of imagination. This woman takes what we now know or understand to be some kind of hallucinogenic. And she says, I flew. I can tell you where I flew. I can tell you how I flew. I can tell you what it looked like. But 
her body was present the entire time. Scott doesn't take on the science of it. Of course, the science of it didn't exist during this period in history. But it's clear with our modern thinking, with our modern mind, what is happening here. She is hallucinating. She is traveling. But it's the product of an herb. It's the product of a drug. There is actually no physical flight happening. One of the excuses that's made for this experience is that only old women that are melancholic, whose nature is extreme cold and their evaporation small, are likely to have this experience. They both perceive and remember what they see in that case and taking of theirs. So there's an excuse built into this that yes, this happens, no women are not flying, but it's only the old women who it happens to. It's only these cold women that it happens to. Blaming this belief on the woman herself. And again, reinforcing that idea is that these witches are old women, indigent women, cold women, women after their child producing years that are going to be likely to have this experience. I want to jump ahead a little bit. I want to make sure that we look at Macbeth. So speaking of a woman that is beyond her child producing years, Lady Macbeth. Lady Macbeth is not called a witch explicitly within the world of the play. But I will make a very staunch argument for Lady Macbeth being the fourth witch. She is not one of the three weird sisters. She does not participate in any of their spells. But having looked at the spells that Hecate and her witches, her coven, do, it's not too far. We don't have to take too many steps to see that Lady Macbeth is also doing magic. She is also a witch. So this is the first speech that she makes after having received Macbeth's letter that says, I met these weird sisters. They told me I was going to be king. This is wild. I'm coming home. And she says, Glams thou art and Cawdor and shalt be what thou art promised. Yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but would the illness should attend it, but without the illness should attend it. What thou wouldst highly, that wouldst thou holily, wouldst not play false, and yet would strongly win. Thou wouldst have great glom as that which cries, thus thou must do. If thou have it, and that which rather thou dost fear to do, then wishes should be undone. Hie thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, and chastise with the valor of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round, which fate and meso- metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned withal. So she acknowledges her husband's weakness, but she also says, come here, come here that I may pour my spirits in thine ear. Now her spirits could be a physical potion, it could be a literal spirit, or it also could be a metaphysical spirit, that I may pour my spirit, that I may talk to you so that you'll see what you need to do to get the crown, the golden round. She gets a little bit more serious in the next part of the speech. She says, the raven himself is hoarse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood, stop up the access and passage to remorse that no compunctious visitings of nature shall shake my fell purpose nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers, wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief. Come, thick night, and pall thee in the dumbest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, hold, hold. In the same way that we saw Hecate and her coven using masculine language and making claim over masculine words to describe feminine bodies, Lady Macbeth is doing the same thing. And she is, we could argue, doing it even more explicitly. 
She says, come you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here. Don't let me be a woman. Free me from the fetters of my sex, of my body, and give me the power to do what I want. This is deeply steeped in desire, her desire for power. And one of the ultimate questions of the play would be her desire of, for power for herself or her desire for power for her husband. Fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. At the same time that her husband is too full of the milk of human kindness, a direct reference to Jesus Christ, she wants to be filled full with direst cruelty. Take my milk, make my make thick my blood, stop up the access and passage to remorse, right? She says, take my milk for gall, directly engaging with ideas about Galenic medicine that said that of the humors in the body, a mother's milk is, a, is sourced from her blood. And so the child absorbs the mother's spirit, her good qualities, her bad qualities through that milk. And Lady Macbeth is saying, take it, right? Take my mother's milk, make it into gall, make it into bile, make it into these bad humors that create anxiety and hate and give me the power to do the thing that I want to do, to do the thing that I know I have to do. This idea of murder, this idea of mother's milk comes back later in the play when Macbeth is hesitating to kill Duncan. Lady Macbeth responds with, again, some of the most powerful speech in the play. When you durst do it, then you were a man. And she's saying this directly to her husband. They're the only two people on stage. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. Nor time nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves, and that their fitness now does unmake you, and the they in that context is the witches. I have given suck and know how tender tis to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from its boneless gums and dashed the brains out, as I had so sworn, as you have done to this. Macbeth was a real man. This play is sourced from Hollinshed's Chronicles. It is sourced from British history. Lady Macbeth was a real woman, so much as that history can be relied upon. There is evidence that she may have had a child, but that child was not the production of her marriage to Macbeth. So she had a child from a previous marriage. She marries Macbeth. He's her second husband. They do not have any children. That, that child that she's given birth to may have been older, may have died. But she is saying in the fiction of the play, reflecting the honesty of, of the history, I know what that's like. I know what it is to breastfeed a child. And you have done to my dream what it would be like for me to take that child and dash its brains out. A lot of violence against children tonight, but Macbeth's response is incredibly important. And this is where I wanna end for the evening. His response to her is bring forth men children only for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. Again, returning to this idea about Galenic medicine, this idea of humors, it was believed during the period that in order for a woman to conceive a child, her will and the will of her husband, there was like an internal fight. And whoever won was the one who determined the sex of the child. So he is saying that there is so much masculine energy in you. There's so much power in you that you could only ever have male children, bring forth men children only. There's no way that you could give birth to female children. Galen argues that this is because male children are produced out of a warm body and female children are produced out of a cold body. So Macbeth may be saying in some circuitous way that, you know, you're pretty hot, literally and figuratively, bring forth men, children only. You're strong so that you'll bring forth men, children only. And it's this kind of speech, it's this kind of text that actually makes the rest of the play quite sad because he 
pushes her out. She says, tell me of your plans. Tell me what you intend to do. And he says, I'm not going to tell you anything. She, of course, begins sleepwalking. She unfortunately ends her own life. And whether the play intends to or not, it tells us a story about what happens to masculine women, what happens to powerful women. That is not the same story that the witch tells. The witch's story of Hecate is one of unfettered power. She keeps that power. But Middleton's The Witch is, is singular in that sense because every other witch play features the downfall of the witch. The Witch of Edmonton, she dies at the end. Macbeth, she dies at the end. Mother Bombi, she's pushed out at the end. It's like a non-ending. And so Hecate is the only one that gets to keep that power. And we'll have to think more about what that means um, in context and out of context. Um, but I would love to take questions or open up conversations if there are, are questions or thoughts in the group.